Congrats, you've made it to the end of the course. I intentionally opted not to teach you Java from the perspective of test automation because that's limiting. I taught you Java in general, and with this new skill, now you can do any programming that you desire, including test automation. But since this is a course on Test Automation University, I want to show you how prepared you are, even though we didn't explicitly work on test automation problems. In this chapter, I'm going to show you a real test automation project that uses Selenium WebDriver. But please note that you can use your new skills with other automation libraries as well, including ones for mobile, API automation, or back-end automation. In this chapter, I'll highlight how we use the concepts taught in this course in the context of test automation. Here is a test automation project. I want to show you the packages here. So notice we have lots of packages this time, lots of different classes in here, and this is typical of a test automation project. But you've learned all about packages, you've learned about classes, so you know how they relate to one another. Let's take a look at one of the classes. This one is a class called Base Test. This looks familiar to us. How do you define classes? We see here, even though we don't know what these objects are, we do know that these are global objects. We know what the private and protected and the static mean for these objects. This particular one is a web driver object. And you'll become very familiar with that once you learn about Selenium web driver. This page object is one that we created within our framework. I'm gonna let us take a look at this one. Okay, we have our class declaration, nothing new there. You see here, there's also some fields. One is protected. The rest of these are private fields. These are locators which you'll also learn about when you learn Selenium WebDriver, or there's also a web element locator strategy course taught by Andrew Knight here on Test Automation University. We see here a constructor. This is using the this call to set the WebDriver. We've learned all about that. And then we see some methods here. This page is a generic page that's holding all of the elements of that page as fields, and then methods to interact with that page, like clicking on things within it. This is known as the page object model design pattern, which you'll learn more about in other courses as well, but I hope this doesn't look foreign to you. We see things like return, we see object types, and things like this. Let's go back to base test and look at this a little bit more. We see calls to method. We know that this is a method. We see instantiations of new objects. We see this links.home, which tells us home must be a static constant variable. If we look at that, yep, that's exactly what it is because we're using that convention. We see decision structures here in our test automation code using this to determine if we're on Windows and we set a property some type of way, or if we're not on Windows, we do something else. This is a good use of decision structures within your test automation code. This is base test. Let's look at an actual test class. So we'll look at this search test. And we see that this class is extending base test, which means it's inheriting from that class. We see the use of a typical variable. So in test automation, we can use variables for things that we're testing. So we're gonna say the product name is Apple TV. And then we use some object called homepage to call a method search and pass in that product name. Where did this homepage come from? I don't see it defined anywhere in this class. Well, of course, we inherited from base test, so it must exist there. And sure enough, there it is. We see these assert methods, which are part of JUnit, which will allow us to determine if a test is true or false. It's just a call to a method 
We're just passing in some data. We're calling some methods here. So this is saying, is the product listed in the search results? And search results is an object. Let's look in search results. So this search results class, again, we see private fields. We see public methods, nothing new. We see constructors. All of this is stuff that we've learned about. We see here the use of a list. So we're getting all of the listed products from a page within our application. That's a good use of a list within test automation. We see here an enhanced for loop to loop over all of those products to actually find the product that we're looking for. We see another decision structure to say, okay, as we're looping through all of the products that are listed here, does the current one that we're on equal, and we see the use of the equals we talked about, does that equal the product name that we're looking for? If so, return that object. Let's look at another page class. So this is a cart page. This is representing the cart page within some application. And it's inheriting from page because remember, page is representative of any page within an app. It's a super class to all other pages. We see here still some fields. We see constructor. Aha, and look at the call to the super constructor. We already know that this is going to make a call into this page's constructor, which takes a web driver. This is all stuff that we've learned. And then we see another decision structure. So in case of this, it will throw a new exception. We just learned about exceptions in the last chapter. We see how that's used in test automation. So the idea here is that you know enough to move forward in test automation should that be your journey. Everything that you've learned in this course is applicable to test automation. Sure, there will be more that you need to learn, such as Selenium Web Driver, if you're going to be doing UI automation, or we have rest assured classes on Test Automation U if you're going to be doing API testing. Whatever you'd like to do, now you have the foundation to move forward. I have one final exercise for you. Consider it as a final project. It's exercising a lot of the things that we've learned throughout this course. Of course, it's optional, but I strongly encourage you to do it. So you're going to create an object-oriented coin toss game. And this project will consist of three classes. The first class is coin, and it should contain a field called side, encapsulation, constant variables, for heads and tails, a method called flip, which randomly chooses heads or tails and assigns that value to side. Your second class will be one called player. This one will have fields called name and guess. You'll also have encapsulation in player and then add a constructor which accepts a player's name. And then finally, the third class will be one called Coin Toss Game, which creates two players, ask player one to choose heads or tails, ensures that player one's guess is valid, don't move on until player one actually has a valid guess, and then automatically assign player two's guess to the opposite of what player one chose. You're gonna flip the coin in this class to determine which side it landed on. And then you're gonna determine a winner based on what the coin landed on. Also be sure to use methods appropriately in this class. Give it a go. It's been my absolute pleasure to share this course with you. It has definitely been a labor of love I hope that you're better for it. Take care.